Our next uh, paper is by Robert uh, Shackleton on genetic and linguistic distances among English and American dialects. I try to usually, I'm kind of following on uh, what John's been, and trying to do something rather similar, which is to aggregate a whole bunch of data from, uh, from informants. Oh, that's not so good. Let's try, let's try it that way. <laughs> uh, aggregate a bunch of data from, from, a, from a group of, oh, that still doesn't work. Well, anyway, so I can say, Take, doing a, a rather similar thing, which is try to aggregate a bunch of different features uh, for a bunch of different speakers. So what I try to do is take the data, uh, some of the data that's also found in the, in, or it's from the Lampses, but it's found in Kurat and McDavid's pronunciation of English in the Atlantic States. Uh, since I uh, don't have that much linguistic background and I don't have, uh, the, uh, have been reluctant to use the, uh, the computer, the, the, uh, the digital corpus. Corporate, I've tried to, uh, to just take the data that's right in the book, and it's, it, this is data that's mapped by features, and take the, the mapping of the features, put that in the database, and play with that. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to get data that's both from uh, the United States and from England, and it turns out that Loman collected data in, um, in England also, and he asked the same questions, and so he got a whole bunch of different responses for informants who are older, rural, uh, people in various parts of southern England and the same kind of data for these people in the United States. So I thought it would be interesting to take data from uh, Massachusetts up around uh, the area where the Puritans settled in this, along the south coast and then the area of East Virginia, um, you know, around Norfolk, down along the Carolina coast, part of the way down the Carolina coast around the, uh, the Albemarle Sound. And then data from West Virginia, Southern West Virginia, and Southwestern Virginia. So I've got these three locations, three regions in the U.S., and then uh, Southern England, and I'm trying to um, and trying to compare the speakers in those three regions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I have data for a number of speakers and about 80 different feet or 80 different uh, album, or 80 different um, uh, features, which I. And they cover about 200, all the other you have about 80, 285 variants. Uh, those variants were classified from this, this quite variable data into 200, 285 variants by uh, Lum, I mean by Corrup and McDavid. So there's the kind of data that it is. This is the English data. Uh, the data, and I've done some clustering with this stuff, and it tends to cluster as follows. You've got East Anglia as a, a relatively distinctive feature. You've got Southeast England as a relatively distinctive feature, which you can see in the dark uh, spots there. And um, then you've got the East Midlands, which is sort of a wedge like this. And this is southwestern England. There's some people over here in Devonshire, and they're pretty distinct also. So it's kind of five English uh, regions. Uh, interestingly, four of those regions are a butt onto London, the, the metropolitan area, which is kind of interesting. Um, so those are the four regions. You've got data, I've got this data on these, on these informants. And I've tried three uh, different approaches to this. Like one thing is to just say, okay, well, we have all these variants. You take two speakers and compare them and see, well, how many variants do they share? Out of the, the total variants that they have, how many do they share with another speaker? Another way of doing this is as long as you have those, as long as you have frequencies of variants, you can use something like a genetic distance, uh, basically using a, taking the metaphor that variants of a given phoneme are, the, are analogous to alleles of a given gene and then use the genetic distance measures to see what you get. And then I tried to do something which I guess is kind of like the Levenstein distance, but it's basically sort of setting up a vowel grid, an idealized vowel grid, and then taking these different phonemes and, and, point, and putting them in the grid and then measuring the Euclidean distance in the grid. Um, and for, this is supposed to be an E eh and an A. Eh. Just the idea is that E eh and A eh are closer to each other than E and all, right? and try to measure that as a Euclidean distance and then see if you get something similar, and then aggregate up across all these different features to see what you get. So obviously all these measures involve some arbitrary assumptions, which phonemes you include, um, the, how you classify responses into variants and say that two, two different responses are actually uh, the same variant, uh, and if you don't think they're the same variant, how you classify, how you measure the distance between them. Um, an important difference, though, is that taking the shared variance or genetic distance uh, approach where you have these fixed variants, you're basically assuming the variants are kind of discrete entities, whereas if you do this other approach where you try to measure distance, you, they don't necessarily have to be um, uh, uh, discrete entities. They can be continuous variants.
variables in fact. So the genetic approach I've used is uh, calculating something called nase genetic distance, which is based, which is a, the appropriate thing to do if you have, if you need a certain, a certain set of assumptions. I don't want to go into right now, except to say these assumptions are pretty questionable for this linguistic distance. So that's kind of a problem. But uh, basically, in this data, um, the important point is that, uh, that this distance, uh, that when you compare two speakers, you get a measure that ranges between something like 0 and 1.7 for the most distant speakers. The speakers who share the fewest variants in common. Um, if, you, if two speakers share about 50% of their variance, the distance is about 0.7. That's how that's basically how it works out. With this linguistic approach then, right, I've taken this grid, and then I basically I have a representation of height, a representation of backing, whether, uh, whether the vowel is rounded or unrounded, and whether it's rhotic or not. So every, every uh, variant has four numbers associated, a vector of four numbers associated with it. And then if it's a length and one, I make it eight numbers. And if it's a diphthong, it's eight numbers with two sets of these four numbers. So everything you know, has four or eight, a vector of four or eight numbers associated with it. And I'm just measuring distances between those, right? So, you know, for, for example, in one of these maps, the word is boiled, and you've got biled and boiled and so on. And I've got a number, I've got a vector associated with each of those, and I'm just measuring the Euclidean distance between two vectors. That's all it is. And uh, the, interestingly, that linguistic distance also ranges from about 0 to 1.7. But in this case, if, you share, if two speakers share 50% of their variance, the linguistic distance can be quite a number of different things because in the variance that they don't share, those variants could be really distant from each other in a sense, or not that distant from each other. So, so you get a little bit more, or at least different, information. 